Do you think we're set to go? Yep, we're good. Okay, sounds great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Becca Franzen. I'm an associate professor at UWSP, and I'm one of the moderators for the uh, EE Pro Group, the Higher Education Group. And uh, Maxwell has posted a link there to the discussion where we can continue the conversation even after um, the webinar today. But um, I'm so glad that Hillary and Elisa are here today to present and to share what they've been busy working on. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here, Hillary, and I'm gonna turn it over to you guys so that you can introduce yourselves and get rolling. Excellent. Um, and we're, uh, I have to tell you that we are here representing a, a national network of people, uh, some of whom are uh, joining us today. So we're hoping to uh, be able to share a little bit more oh, hold on, of what they do as well. Can you see my screen okay now, Becca? Yep. That's great. Okay, so hopefully if we're all on the same page, uh, we are on a, our title screen, which says Deepening Environmental Learning for Student Teachers. So welcome to everybody who's joined us today. We're so appreciative of your time and of being able to continue a conversation that we've been engaged in in a couple for the last couple of years. Um, and one that is very near to both uh, my heart and to Elisa's heart and to uh, a number of faculty members here in, uh, in Canada. Um, my name is uh, Hilary Inwood. I'm the lead of the Environmental and Sustainability at initiative at the University of Toronto. Uh, where I'm part of uh, our, our Faculty of Education, which is called OISE, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. And Elise, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'd love to. My name is Elise Kennedy. I'm a recent grad from the Master of Teaching program here at OISE at U of T. I'm also a supply teacher with the Toronto District School Board for the elementary panel. Uh, I do a lot of work with outdoor education and our eco schools group. And I've also um, decided to dive into doctoral research here, looking at environmental ed. So that's sort of how Hillary and I came to be a, a partnership. So that's great. Uh, as one of our alumni and a, a, a student that I worked with both um, as a pre-service student and also as a doctoral student, Elise has uh, lots of different fingers and different pies, but yeah. all relate to this pie, which is, which yeah. is great. Um, so I've had a question from Richard in the chat room, just asking if this session will be recorded, and it absolutely will be. We've got um, Max from the NAAEE with us today, who can help you to um, deal with any technical issues you might have if you have any problems with Zoom, uh, though we're thrilled that he's using Zoom because it's, it's a really great system uh, to use and uh, really easy to use. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, we really do want this to be more of a conversation rather than a lecture. So we really encourage uh, all of you to please post your questions in the chat room and we'll address them as best we can as we, as we go along. And Becca, thank you so much for the opportunity to, yes, uh, to talk about this area of environmental learning that's so incredibly important in higher education. So uh, you've been telling us a little bit about yourselves. Thank you so much to start off with. Um, you, if you've got your chat room turned on, you can also follow along what people have been posting so you can learn. It sounds like so far, unless I'm wrong, uh, we're all faculty who teach in pre-service programs so far. Um, if I'm wrong about that, please correct me in the, in the chat room. We have a second question for you, and we just wanted to know how important it is uh, to do. Uh, what we're, we're going to use the acronym of ESE quite a bit, Environmental and Sustainability Education uh, in Pre-Service Education. So uh, give us a little rating there. You can rate us out of 10 if you want. Um, oh, uh, Max, uh, Becca just said, put it into, sorry, Becca, I didn't is realize. The notes at the bottom? Do you want the notes? Should no, I, I don't want the notes. So <laughs> we're going to try and put this into, hold on. I just got to tap into PowerPoint if I can get it um, to put it into presentation mode. And I don't know, I think I have to do that. I'm going to stop the share for a minute. I think I have to do it before I put it into just one sec. You? Yep. Um, How do I get into Can you see that, Becca, now? No, I can't. Yeah, I, I don't. Share, yeah. Oh, can you go ahead and so do you want Sorry. To share? No, we want to get rid we of it. We were joking thing. about how, to everybody else, we were joking about how you need to have technical issues. We do, for oh, webinars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's try that. Do that. And, and then maybe maybe a multiple screens. Yeah, the current slide, right? Yeah. Which is over here. Yep. See, that's the other reason the lease is a little long. Um, if we put it into slideshow mode, I don't know if you can see it. I think, um, this would be okay. I think we have to go back into Zoom and share from there again. Yes. Sorry. We'll be with you in just one second. We'll try it this way. Okay. We got rid of the notes, but you might still be able to see the mini slides on the left. I don't know. You'll have to tell me when I when we boost this up in a minute. Can you still see the mini slides on the left? Mm 
Yep, yeah. we don't see the notes. So that looks great. Yeah, the notes are That's not okay, there though? anymore. Yeah, that's okay. just good because we weren't going to use the notes. So I'm really glad we got rid of those. Yeah. <laughs> that would just confuse everybody for yeah. sure. So we're wondering how important you think uh, this particular topic is. I'm assuming that, uh, you know, maybe uh, you do think this is of importance uh, because you're here. I'm just not going to access the chat room again. We've lost it somewhere in our barrage of screens. Mm -hmm. oh. We'll do more. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Richard just says, yes. yes. <laughs> we agree with you, Richard. <laughs> we think it's a really important topic too. Um, so uh, I'm going to assume as you're here that you are uh, considering it to be an important topic. I do want to just give a little bit of background on our terminology before we start. I know that NAAEE certainly uses the, um, the term environmental education for the work it does. Uh, here at OASE and um, certainly um, with our national network here in Canada, we've been using the term environmental and sustainability education. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to define a little bit about what that means because it's not as commonly used, of course, as EE or even uh, ESD in Education for Sustainable Development. Um, we, as far as we're concerned, ESE is a con really focused on helping people become responsible, knowledgeable, and active citizens. Uh, we really do think that um, uh, that you know, emphasizing the importance of environmental well-being holistically is an important component of what we do in environmental ed. Though it's not always a central discussion in uh, traditional EE circles, uh, the reality is we can't. Uh, really do environmental ed if we're considering without considering people's uh, health and well-being and making sure that we have a healthy and sustainable world mm -hmm. uh, moving forward. Uh, we certainly want to be developing um, our teacher candidates, uh, knowledge, attitudes, um, beliefs, and their actions, all to support a sustainable future. And we'd like to certainly, when they're with us on campus in pre-service programs, model positive social and environmental change. That's an important part of what we do too. Mm -hmm. We also just want to point out though that we use the term ESE quite broadly to uh, really be uh, a lovely way of referencing a whole variety of traditions when it comes to environmental learning. Um, you know, there's been a little bit of terminology wars in uh, higher ed in the past when it comes to using whether you choose to use environmental education or education for sustainable development or even sustainability education, which is very popular in Australia, for example. Uh, the reality is that uh, we, uh, we see ESC as incorporating and referencing a whole variety of traditions. Here in Canada, for example, Indigenous education is a, a growing uh, importance that connects to land-based learning, for example. And as far as we're concerned, you can't do uh, in environmental and sustainability ed without referencing and connecting to and supporting Indigenous education, notions of reconciliation and decolonization. Mm -hmm. But nature-based learning falls into this category, place-based education, um, eco-justice education, all of these things are important, I think. Um, and they're all different uh, traditions of environmental learning uh, that I think can fall nicely under this umbrella. Yeah. That we're I love it today. because it means you can really, you can get into environmental ed in different ways. If you're coming from a nature-loving background, if you're coming from an equity lens, like there's no one way to go about it. And that's yeah. great because it's really, really accessible. Yeah. We like to think of this uh, holistically rather than fractionally. So uh, we also just want to make a reference briefly that uh, the, you know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are super important in this work as well. Uh, lots of them touch on uh, notions of environmental learning. Uh, and again, it, when we think about these, you know, really huge problems we have in the world, we've got to ta tackle them in a holistic way. It's uh, almost impossible to tease them apart ultimately. So in the chat room, um, we would just like to ask you a question to get going again. Um, what is it that you believe teacher candidates should be learning about when it comes to uh, ESE mm -hmm. in pre-service teacher education? We've given you a couple of starting points. Uh, is there a specific um, set of competencies in knowledge, for example, that they should be learning about? Is, are there specific skills that they should be touching on? Are there attitudes and beliefs? that you think are important. So can you just, if everybody just taps in one thing, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Knowing that we're not gonna hit on all of them uh, to, uh, to start off with. I will point out uh, in this little plug for NAAEE that they've got a great set of guidelines for excellence when it comes to the professional development of environmental educators uh, and teacher educators, uh, sorry, uh, teacher candidates as well. So if you haven't seen those in the past, uh, it would be great to, uh, to have those on to pull those okay. down so doug says knowledge concepts such as 
holism, interdisciplinary, and interconnectedness. Very Agree nice. with that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And Becca's agreeing with you, Doug. I think that she's also focused on the notion of interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. Yep. And from Richard, um, uh, give me what can you, Richard? Can you tell us what KSW is? That's not. Is that um, KSD? A KSD. Excuse me. Yeah. Is that knowledge building or inquiry? Just, you've got system thinking down as part of that as as well. KSD is not an acronym that we're that I'm familiar yeah, with, so yeah. I'd love to know more about that. Environmental literacy from Heidi. Yep. Yeah, interdisciplinary for sure. Oh, knowledge, skills, and dispositions. Thank ah, you. That's a nice it. short form. I'm cool. going to make note of that yeah, one for future that. reference. Yeah. Um, I, it sounds like we're all in agreement that this is uh, connected work, right? Yes. That we need to focus on interdis interdisciplinary approaches. Um, and our colleague Doug has done some great work uh, thinking about whether that should be integrated, infused, or interdisciplinary. Um, Doug, maybe you can post uh, the title of one of your articles on that topic uh, in relationship to uh, this area as That's well. Great. And thanks, Max, for giving us the NAAE guidelines. The link. Yeah, right fantastic. Perfect. perfect. There it is to the pre-service one, too. Sorry, I couldn't find that one on the website, so I'm yeah. really glad you gave me. I knew it exists. I just didn't have the link to it, so I'm really pleased that you posted it up there. Um, I know Paul's made a note about inquiry-based approaches, and we are going to talk about that moving forward, Paul. In fact, Paul, I'm hoping maybe you can talk a little bit more about that in the chat room uh, as we get to, uh, to talk about this moving forward. Uh, we do want to point out that this is a really active field uh, in terms of research, um, not only in Canada, but around the world. Um, here in Canada, um, many of us were quite inspired by a, a research study that was done by our Council of Ministers of Education in Canada in 2012. Uh, this came out of the group in Manitoba, and um, they did a really nice research piece looking specifically, and they called it ESD, um, was being played out in faculties of ed across the country. Uh, we were thrilled that OISE was one of the faculties that they did a deep dive into, because we've been doing a lot of work in this area. Um, they, uh, I just want to highlight what they came up with at the end. They said that this has got to be a core component of teacher education programs. These are our ministries of, of education from across the country that came up with this conclusion that ESD should really be central to what we do. And while there are faculties of education across our country that are doing this work, we know that there are many programs. Becca, yours is a great example in Wisconsin that does a lot of work in this area as well. Uh, we know that there are a number of teacher education programs in Australia doing work. Um, around the world, there aren't enough of us doing it. Um, it really isn't a core component of most teacher education programs. I really wish it was. Um, so there are lots of people that are doing research in this area. We'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward as well. Um, but in Canada, we've also got something called the Sustainability Education Policy Network that has started as a national endeavor, but um, has really grown into an international endeavor um, because it's done so much great research in this area. If you're not familiar with their work, uh, they've done a, a wonderful study on looking specifically at how universities' policies uh, influence the delivery of sustainability education um, in, in our higher ed situations here as well. So if you're not familiar with them, I can I put the link there on the slide that you can refer back to. <laughs> and Doug has shared one of his own articles, which is great. <laughs> oh, there, there it is. Thank you so much, Doug, because I know that that's a, a great piece talking about the different ways that we can approach uh, ESE, uh, whether it's through infusion, um, through an integration approach. And so if you want more on that, Doug's um, title for his article is there. So there, we know that there are lots of opportunities mm -hmm. to do this work in um, pre-service teacher education. So I think you're going to talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to. So um, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of benefits and opportunities happening. Um, some of the ones that we've been sort of the most aware of and seen happening the most is modeling a more holistic, interdisciplinary, like a lot of people were talking about in the chat, uh, and trans overall transformative approach to pre-service teacher education. I mean, even in the time from when I graduated in uh, 2016 from my teacher ed program, and I've seen just so much changes happening here. I know there's so many other changes happening across the mm -hmm. network and across the, the globe, basically. And it's been great, um, really positive stuff happening. And as well as just ensuring social, environmental, and economic sustainability uh, of the faculty. So we know that sustainability isn't just environmental. There are other dimensions to that as well that are important to consider within faculty. And fully supporting the health and well-being of students, faculty, and staff. We know the research behind what's happening and how positively uh, environmental ed benefits everyone. And just from, you know, nature's very healing. Nature can make you just feel better, it can bring people together. Um, just ways of bringing that into the faculty are really important. 
And another one we mentioned a bit earlier was integrating the tenets of Indigenous education, as it's called here in, in Canada. Um, we, we, Hillary and I are both uh, settlers on this land, we're, but we're working to be allies and, and teach about Indigenous ed and bring in Indigenous perspectives in, in good ways and in ways that don't encroach, but celebrate and honour Indigenous uh, perspectives. Mm -hmm. And as well as just overall better collaboration with communities. There's so much going on out there and it can be quite it can be quite busy and it can be quite isolating if you're not connected, which is why this whole network is just a great way of bringing together all these people who have this common goal. And that's why I've been really excited to be a part of it, I think. Great. Wonderful. Thanks, Elise. So while we know that their um, environmental and sustainability ed offers many opportunities to faculties of education and pre-service programs, we know that there's significant challenges and we encourage you to post up in the chat room some of the challenges that you're experiencing right now. You know, we've, we've heard um, across Canada that there are many competing priorities in teacher education and that there isn't always room for um, ESE and that it doesn't always fit into some of our core courses. I'm, I'm gonna guess, Becca, you're shaking your head. I can see you on the visuals. <laughs> and I'm gonna guess that, that you probably hear the same thing in the States many times as well. Um, there really seems to be very little awareness on the part of most of uh, my faculty colleagues about the importance of ESE. Um, that uh, they would tell you that they lack expertise so they can't do this work in their courses. Uh, and certainly, you know, there's no, <laughs> no doubt that we've been missing broader institutional support in doing this work uh, moving forward as well. Mm -hmm. um, systemic change in our faculties is difficult. Uh, you know, a top-down approach with our dean or our department chair saying, you shall do this, often doesn't work. People tend to ignore those kinds of edicts coming down from our <laughs> administrative leaders. And, um, uh, uh, you know, a bottom-up approach sometimes works a little bit better, but getting then the institutional supports you need doesn't always fall into place. So mm -hmm. we know that there's many, many challenges in doing this work and we don't want to gloss those over. Um, in fact, Doug's uh, pointed out that uh, his current dean values artificial intelligence and its role in education over environmental and sustainability ed. We'll, we'll see if AI solves climate crisis, Doug. <laughs> I'm going to guess that it doesn't. I'm going to guess that it probably makes it worse. So, uh, so we'll see how that <laughs> works moving forward. Um, Oh. oh, and Alexander's asking, are the slides available for downloading? I think this will come along as part of the webinar, mm -hmm. uh, Alex, Alexander. So you'll, you'll get this as part of the recording of the webinar. Um, and uh, Becca notes that uh, she's very concerned about the recent state administrative code changes. Um, oh, that li licensing is now covering a broader range of subjects and ages. Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that interesting, Becca? So that, again, changes the mix all over again, doesn't it, when it comes to pre-service teacher ed? Um, we did want to make sure that we left lots of time today to talk about some of the positive things that are happening because it's so easy to dwell yeah. on the negative. Yeah. <laughs> talk about what not is, is not being done and the supports that are not in place. Despite that, there are some really positive things that are happening. And what we're seeing is that um, there are different faculties across Canada that are now taking common ESE principles and they're actually putting them into practice. So we thought we'd give you some very concrete examples with photographs because that makes it far more interesting in a webinar than just seeing yeah. our faces. Um, we've got a list of things that are up there right now. Um, you know, we, we know that universities are really good about investing in physical infrastructure improvements towards sustainability because they figured out a while ago that that saves the money. So <laughs> uh, there's no doubt that that's happening in universities, which is great to see. It's a good first step. But certainly here at U of T, we've seen them doing that, but putting absolutely no money into the education piece, which would really be about helping uh, students and faculty uh, better understand understand their role um, in, uh, in ESC and in, in climate change more uh, broadly. Um, so we're going to give you some examples of some of the things we've listed on this uh, title slide and talk a little bit about what these look like from both the faculty perspective and the teacher candidates perspective. So this first one um, is thinking about the principle of systems thinking and inquiry. These have both been flagged by you in the chat room so far today as being really central to uh, the practice of ESE. And they're playing out in some really wonderful ways uh, in universities in Canada. So um, just recently, we actually hosted AERA, the American Educational Research Association Conference here in Toronto. And here at OISE, we hosted a session specifically on educational gardens in um, universities. And we had uh, both American and Canadian colleagues come to show what they've been doing. The Orchard Garden at the University of British Columbia was one of those featured. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really great way to um, engage students in experiential learning, but also to get them to think about systems thinking and how that really affects the environment and doing it in a really hands-on way. 
Um, I think you experienced that a little bit uh, here when yeah. you were here in the OISI program as well. Definitely. We had a lot of field trips we went on, and one of them, as you can see in this picture on the right, um, that was Evergreen Brickworks, one of the one of the many field trips that we got to go on. And that was a really great way because at least for me, like hands-on learning is, is just really important. Like mm -hmm. I need to do something to remember it and to embody that. And I find that happens a lot with, with students too. Like that's one of those, you know, growth mindset, one of those multiple intelligences that is great for them to really just sort of just experience. Like maybe that's not the way they learn best, but it could be a way that does help them learn and get the full picture. Mm -hmm. So we did some things. We'd go down to a place called Evergreen Brickworks, which was an old, it was the old brick factory that basically built the city of Toronto. And then they've made it into this environmental ecological literacy center. So it's really great. Um, we also did some local field trips just around our building here. Mm -hmm. We have an area called Philosopher's Walk, which is actually this beautiful um, walkway, but it used to be an old, um, it used to be um, a river. Mm -hmm. And over time it's dried up and now it's just, so you can see, it's now just a walkway, but you can see there's bridges from where there used to be a river. So it's cool to go out there and see signs of of um, how, how the area has developed over time and why there were certain things in place that aren't necessary now. And it's great to take kids out there too because you get to teach them like, well, why do we have a bridge and, and that sort of thing. Those inquiry questions mm -hmm. are really important, really good. So good combination of sort of nature-based learning and place-based learning. Yeah, right? yeah, and you're right out there, yeah. out there. Yeah, and good. I know that was done as part of our social studies um, curriculum and instruction course, in fact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, Paul was saying uh, in the chat room that uh, he thinks some teacher candidates uh, doubt the value of EC ESE when they don't see it happening in the schools. And we thought we'd talk, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. talk about that in practicum. Uh, the reality is though, more and more schools are getting learning gardens. So when we're modeling these kinds of things on campus, and I know Paul, you've got a learning garden at Trent University in Peterborough. Um, you know, we, we, we know that they're coming back and they're saying, oh, that's a great idea, but I have no clue how to do it. But if they've seen it modeled on campus in a pre-service program, I think they're much more likely to, uh, to really um, deeply embed these notions, these principles of system thinking and inquiry into what they do and, um, and, and then also be able to replicate them once they head out into the schools. But you're right, seeing them in classrooms is an important part, part of the puzzle as well. I know that Paul does a wonderful course um, that celebrates both system thinking and inquiry at Trent. It's a mandatory course for um, all teacher candidates, uh, which is uh, Indigenous education and environmental education. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul's done some writing about that uh, in articles. Uh, Paul, if you have a reference uh, to it, I'm going to reference your video that's up on, uh, about that, your videos that are up uh, shortly. But if you have an article that you want to uh, post, uh, please do that as well in the chat box. That would be great. Um, thanks, uh, Alexander. You're talking a little bit about how um, OISE has connected with environmental uh, history through Carolyn Merchant's writing. So mm -hmm. thank you for that resource. So a second principle we just want to point out, and, and Elisa's already sort of touched on it in, in many ways, is this notion of integrated and experiential learning. Mm -hmm. um, we know that in, certainly in science programs, this happens, I think, a little bit more routinely. We have a course on science and environmental education, again, a mandatory course for all of our PJ and JI teacher candidates, our primary, junior, and junior intermediate. Um, and they have to do the, the types of activities that we're seeing on the left. This is actually one of our team members, Maurice DiGiuseppe, um, at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, doing a, a field studies component with some of his science students. So they happen often in science courses, but what we're not seeing is so often happening in other types of curriculum and instruction courses. Um, what are your memories of that, Elise? From uh, You've talked a little bit about going outside on campus mm -hmm. and down to Evergreen Brickworks here in Toronto. Um, are there any other types of experiential hands-on learning that really made an impact on you as a pre-service uh, teacher candidate? Um, for me, just getting the opportunity to do a practicum in um, outdoor education centers was really valuable to mm -hmm. me. Um, and also just, you know, being in a regular classroom as well and bringing in environmental ed, but doing the outdoor ed centers was just accept, like an exceptional opportunity because, you know, when you start your teacher training program, you're taught, you're still taught in a certain way where you're kind of confined to these four walls, basically. Mm -hmm. And we know that things are changing, but we know that things are slow to change as well. So being kind of thrown to the wolves in this practicum where there are no walls, you're outside, you're learning off the land, you know, all day long is, it's just really powerful because I think it was a really like daunting experience at first for me because you know, if you don't really get that same same training in a classroom that you would, mm -hmm. yeah, same like you would for learning math or teaching math and that sort of thing. But it was amazing, and it was great to just be able to be out in nature and doing activities that do relate and are interdisciplinary and are inquiry based. So things that you wouldn't necessarily think, but we I remember one lesson really that was really strong for me was we got to 
uh, find out how to how to age trees, so how to find out the age of a tree. And you know, back in the day, they used to just cut down these trees to find out the age of them. But now there's there's um, a calculation you can do using pi, and you measure the circumference, and it depends on the growth factor. Of the that tree. would be your math uh, ESE integration. Yeah, you go. and then you, yeah. Can, you can do an art project <laughs> about it. So just ways to show that it's not it's not something like out there. It's something right here in your environment and right outside your classroom. And that's how I think we're going to change things to make it so that teachers aren't so scared or aren't don't have the you know aren't insecure and they can figure it out. It's it's not as hard as it seems. So Becca's asked how long the practicum experience. Our practicum experiences are a month long, mm -hmm. Becca, and they have to do four one month periods in our program over two years. Mm -hmm. So we'd be making some purposeful connections so that our students uh, who are interested in outdoor ed and want to gain more experience in it can go and do their practicum placements there, which has been really wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, and Heidi, I think at least would probably agree with you that it really was a cool. It was Best. Yeah. And there's been a, a professional implication for you coming out of that in that you're now being hired in as a substitute teacher in yeah. the outdoor ed centers, Yeah, which so is quite amazing. I wouldn't have known yeah. that. And now they pay me to do it. Yeah. So that's great. <laughs> that's what we hope, right? Is that yeah. full cycle will happen uh, from pre-service right into in-service. So, you know, one of the other, one of the principles that we believe strongly is both place-based learning and land-based learning. And land-based learning specifically referencing um, indigenous traditional knowledge uh, in its approach. Uh, we've got a number of universities across um, Canada that are experimenting with this. Uh, certainly uh, Trent, um, we've just made reference to Paul uh, Elliott, um, who does a, a course uh, with his colleague Nicole Bell um, that specifically references uh, land-based learning and indigenous people. They also have a practicum that Nicole's led in the past uh, on that too. Um, they have a wonderful pedagogy to place course too at the University of um, Saskatchewan. One of our colleagues, Janet Mithidi, has been very involved in this. Um, and uh, I think it's been a, just a fantastic way to really start to unpack some of the complexities, both the theoretical and the practical complexities of place-based learning um, as part uh, of that. So we're seeing um, certainly some of our faculties of ed across Canada start to, uh, to do this work. Mm -hmm. Um, and then finally, I had to put this reference in because uh, my own um, research area is in environmental art making, which really does draw on both uh, affective and creative learning as uh, sort of, I, I think, a relatively innovative approach, uh, only because uh, um, environmental and sustainability has been so deeply rooted in science ed in the past, and, and bless our science colleagues for doing such strong work with it over the years. But it really is time that we take this across programs, and yes. we're getting very positive responses to doing this. Um, here at OISE. We know that not all of our teacher candidates um, really truly understand or um, want to understand the stats related to climate change, for example. But when you take them out and you're learning um, experientially, you're learning on the land and you're translating that and understanding it through either an aesthetic or an affective lens, that it's it's learning that really stays with them. And um, I, we every year here at OISE, we do an environmental art installation. We've actually got 13 now in our main stairwell. Oh, wow. Um, and we every year we invite uh, our grad students from across OISE to join us to create, collaboratively create these installations. And we found that to be a really powerful means of learning for them. Um, so uh, if anybody wants to uh, check it, check that out, just go to ecoart at OISE. I'll post the link up maybe later yeah. and um, you'll find the the photographs of the collection and, and the description of what it is that we've done in the past. And just to add to that, um, we, I just find that eco art has been a great way, another, another way into teaching and learning about the environment. Mm -hmm. Um, Hillary and I have been studying sort of the impact of people who've been involved in these eco art projects. And one of my, the interviewees that ta I talked to was saying how, you know, it really changed their perspective on teaching about the environment because they, this person never, they didn't come from a science background. So they thought sort of environment was something they couldn't really touch. It was something reserved for someone else and they weren't confident enough to talk about it. But through art, they saw themselves more as an artist. So they thought, okay, I can tackle this in this way using something, something I'm more comfortable with. So it was just this whole new, new thing that they could teach that they never thought they could before. Mm -hmm. So it was a great tool yeah, for them. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to point out that our Master of Teaching program at um, OISE is actually our pre-service program. They get their teaching credentials and a master's degree simultaneously. Um, the Master of Education program at Cape Breton University, the other photograph, mm -hmm. is not, but they do have an amazing focus on sustainable happiness. So if you're not familiar with um, Catherine O'Brien's work and Patrick Howard's work in this area, it's well worth looking up their website because uh, they're really, the whole sustainable happiness concept 
does everything that we've been talking about in terms of inquiry and affective learning, experiential learning, it's all kind of woven in together really beautifully. So in the chat room, um, can we really encourage you just to name one practice that you're doing in your teacher ed program uh, that you think uh, could be a promising practice for others. We would love to hear a little bit more on that. And in fact, Richard, you must have anticipated our question. Thank you. Um, he's just finished up a workshop on integrating ELS standards, uh, teachers from K to 12, uh, and you're encouraging Becca to touch base in June. That's great. It sounds like um, that worked really well. Um, Richard, was that an in-service uh, program then, or was that a pre-service? I'm just interested in uh, what level that hit at, because we're going to talk about that pre-service, in-service integration in just Maybe a minute. In-service? Yeah, it, it might be. It says teachers grades K to 12, so I, I'm wondering if that's, um, if that's the case. Doug points out that whenever he can, he integrates uh, ESC into science education, yeah. which I know is your home discipline, Doug. Um, and uh, you encourage subject instructors to do the same. I, I, I'm, I've been trying to do that the same uh, as well. Um, though we might have a little bit more hope down here. Last week, we had our department retreat, and we managed to get climate change on the agenda and we've decided to strike a climate action working group in my department uh, and I'm shocked and pleased about that so maybe I can get more instructors uh, moving forward. Oh so it's for pre-service and existing teachers. Oh that's great. Okay. So yeah, that's great. Piece. That's Excellent. Nice. Thank you Richard. Uh, Richard says that the workshop was for pre-service and existing teachers um, that needed EE background in some way. That's great. We'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward. Oh, and Heidi says they get and they work with GROW um, lacrosse to support elementary children and oh, teaching. Lovely. So yeah, community connections. So good. Fantastic. Um, we know that teacher candidates can take action. It doesn't have to be just be about driven by the faculties of ed. So do you want to speak mm -hmm. about that just for a minute or two? Yeah, I think what was most helpful for me in sort of this list that we compiled is just being just really vocal about advocating for wanting ESE in, in your pre-service program. Um, I know there's not a lot of pre-service teachers on online right now, but these are ways you can also support your, your teacher candidates this way as well by encouraging them to you know go after what they want if they want to see this stuff in their their program it's it has to come from them um, as well as meeting with administrative leads like your department chair and the dean um, I recently coordinated a conference that we have here at Boise for research um, graduate level research at all level very accessible and it wasn't necessarily an environmental conference, but because I was a co-chair, I decided I wanted to implement these principles into it. So we decided to do things like make it a low-waste uh, conference and um, encourage re bringing reusable things and compostable cutlery as opposed to plastic and- Panel discussions, as I sat on Yes, those, yeah. Hillary's <laughs> on our panelists. We had a keynote by John Robinson. We had a bunch of, just, we tried to make it as environmental as we could in a sneaky way. So people didn't know they were signing up for an environmental conference, but they, Came away with that. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's fantastic. So, and so through that, I got to really work closely with our dean. And so through that, I got to become, have a better relationship with him. And then he was able to see that these things are needed and people do really want this stuff. So that's great. Um, as well as just, since we talked about the cross curricular and interdisciplinary, um, everyone's, you know, everyone's really prioritizes their, the math courses, the English, the language, all that, but bringing in environmental ed into that. Like I always tried to bring a focus on environmental issues topic or a way of teaching that was more outdoors into my other courses just because that's what I was passionate about. Um, and, it, and it was great because you'd have presentations to other students and they would maybe they would go more of a standard way and they'd see something I would do and that would spark that conversation. So that was always nice. And you can also attend a lot of professional development and environmental education. We're really lucky here at OISE that um, we have a lot of things happening, but that's also because students have been loud in that they want a lot of things to happen. So there's a lot of things that you can attend. And I know it's a busy, as a teacher candidate, I remember being so busy. I never thought like I'd get any sleep because it's just such a long, long day and mm -hmm. practicum and doing your homework, doing your courses, all that. But if it is possible to just, you know, spend an hour here or there over a lunch and learn or after school, before you go off to a million other things you have to do, it's always important to attend that, that professional development because not just what you're learning, but how you're learning it and who you're meeting in these sessions has been really, really great. Yeah, um, in fact, Paul's made mention that they also run an extracurricular series of workshops. And in fact, Paul's series inspired the start of our series many years ago here at mm. OISE. So, um, you know, talking with colleagues is so important to do. Uh, Judy Halpern's joined us. Um, and uh, Judy, nice to, nice to hear from you. She also runs a co-curricular program called Local, which cool. is fantastic, um, which happens, I think, a, a little bit uh, 
in addition to the regular teacher ed program. Um, but uh, lovely to hear about that as, as well, Judy. If you have a link, if you have a website, Judy, feel free to post it up yes. to share with other people uh, in here too. Um, so just want to, um, uh, whoops, point out. Oh, hold on. I think we had another question for you. Yes. Oh, yeah. How, um, how else can, if you have any other suggestions of how teacher candidates can take the lead in improving the presence of ESE and pre-service teacher education programs, please feel free to post that up in the chat room as well so we can share those uh, more broadly with others. I did want to make a note, by the way, Alexander mentioned that um, he has also been um, uh, in integrating ESE into a course on curriculum design mm -hmm. that he teaches. Cool. Uh, and I do the same for my fundamentals course of teaching, uh, Alexander. I have a presence for it uh, there as well. So I think there's lots of ways to do it. It just means we need to do maybe a little bit more work with our colleagues in terms of getting them up to speed on how to do that uh, work. Mm -hmm. um, now, I do want to point out one other way, um, and this sort of references something we touched on a little bit earlier um, in the chat room, was this notion of bringing pre-service and in-service together. Here at OISE, we have the largest teacher ed program in the country. We've got about a thousand teacher candidates, so it's very large. Um, and at the local school board, the Toronto District School Board, the TDSB, um, they have, they're the largest school board in Canada and one of the largest in North America. And so we've actually brought the two together recently and we've been doing professional learning for both pre-service and in-service together. And this has been a really positive um, undertaking. And I think uh, one of our chat room participants, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember who that was, uh, mentioned this uh, earlier. Uh, that was Richard. Yeah. Uh, and so Richard, we've been doing this on a wide scale for the last two years here in Toronto. It's been going really well. Mm -hmm. So Richard, you and I might want to touch base and think about a, a, an article or something together to share what we've been doing. Yeah. Um, I think that that model of bringing teacher candidates together early in their careers to talk with the champions who do this work in classrooms is so important. Yeah. Uh, we've been seeing so many positive effects that have been doing spinning off of bringing them together. The relationships that, alone. Yeah, yeah the relationships that. have been great. Like right? We have a lot of grads and yeah. like myself included people who um, you know came to a workshop to learn something and then left with like a contact info for someone to, to go deeper and learn more and yeah. that started a relationship where someone wanted to uh, be in a be a a student teacher for a teacher they met in that that workshop and then that launched into something else and now that person has a job and they're so it just becomes this like really huge springboard for all these amazing relationships and future opportunities which has been really really good yeah absolutely and then becca says student oh. organizations yep. yeah i agree with that for sure yeah um, you know, there's lots of ways that faculties of ed could take next steps uh, in improving this work. We've got a whole laundry list here. Uh, we've always got lots of ideas. It's getting the implementation done that's the hard part, right? Um, uh, I think there's uh, things that our national network have working on. I'm going to sh share a little bit more uh, with you about that in just one sec. I know that um, we are experimenting with all of these in different ways across different faculties of ed in Canada. And when we started talking to each other, um, we realized that we were learning a lot from the dialogue that happened uh, in and amongst um, those of us who uh, we had found. It's sometimes hard to find other people doing this work. You might be the only person in your faculty of ed that's got a, a real keen interest in environmental and sustainability ed. So we formed a national network uh, two years ago. Um, it's called the ESE. Uh, TE group. It's a standing committee of our national organization called ECOM. ECOM in Canada has sort of the equivalent of the NAAAE in the States. A little smaller organization to be fair and we are, ECOM is an affiliate partner of, um, of NAAAE. So we formed a standing committee that's focused specifically on teacher education, both pre-service and in-service, as a way to facilitate dialogue amongst those of us who are doing this work so we can learn from each other. So I just want to point out that we do have a great website um, it, you can get resources off the website. We've got lists of research in this area. We've got lots of information in different forms. Uh, we've got a great set of videos, and I'll just pump up the uh, the YouTube. We have our we have our own YouTube channel, um, which is a kind of a fun thing for many of us. Um, there's a whole set of um, you'll, you'll actually you can see that Paul's videos from Trent University are up there uh, right now. These are nice short videos that we've been making, all under five minutes, that highlight different aspects of practice and ESE. Um, we're uh, absolutely open to others creating short videos and we'd be happy to share whether they're from Canadian faculties of ed or um, American or Australian. We don't, we don't care. We're just really interested in sharing what's great that's going on in different faculties uh, with others. So whether that's on the YouTube channel uh, or whether that's uh, through our, um, our website, um, we do have a, um, a Twitter feed that you can connect into too, uh, which is ESE uh, in fact. 
uh, as a short form. And uh, so far on Instagram, we've just been working on hashtag. I've been adding a lot to the, the growing green teachers hashtag, which I really like that tagline. So I would really encourage you to be uh, sending out um, uh, an Instagram and on Twitter um, your own uh, photographs and stories about what you're doing, uh, but, but post it to that hashtag so that we can all follow along with it as well. Um, I do want to um, give a, a shout out to our national group. We've been working, oh, sorry, we've been working really hard on uh, trying to develop the literature base uh, mm -hmm. in this area. And Doug Caro, who's with us today, has been taking the lead on a lot of our research publications. Thank you, Doug, for your leadership in this regard. Um, the Deeper Publication was our first one. It's more of like a practical guide, which you can pull off our website for free as a PDF. Um, it's more of a practical guide on, on how to do this work, because we really realized that there really wasn't anything out there. There's lots of people who have been talking about it and about it should be done, uh, but very little people sharing about what is actually being done. So we published that one in 2013 and followed that up uh, about a year and a half later with the Canadian Perspectives on Initial Teacher Education uh, Praxis. Uh, and this was one that Doug um, worked on with um, Maurice DiGiuseppe from UOIT uh, and with Yovita, who's joined us today, with too, was one of the editors on this project. Um, and this was a, a great anthology, a starting anthology of what's happening in Canadian faculties of ed. We've got a new one coming out in the fall uh, from Springer. Uh, this one's got Doug, if I'm remembering right, 18 chapters, um, <laughs> which is wonderful. Um, uh, so we're gonna, we'll be posting that on the website, the links to it, uh, so you can check that one out uh, as well. Um, Laura's asked a question about, do you know we can find uh, environmental education in action? Educators. Uh, ah. Environmental educators in action. Um, and how do we do that? So uh, if you want to share some of those videos, you can do that actually, the videos that we just uh, promoted. Uh, Laura on the YouTube channel. That's a great way to do it. Oh, thanks, Becca. You put a. Uh, oh, actually, that's not the. That's the old link. To be fair, Deeper is no longer on that link because we did a rejig of the website. It's on our ESE and Faculties of Education website uh, instead. You can find it under Publications uh, area. And another um, resource might be the Green Teacher article that was just published. Yep. Um, yep. On an action research team that's happening here with the TDSB. Um, it's a short article in Green Teacher Magazine that just came out uh, a few weeks ago, and it talks about different vignettes, different stories from four teachers, mm -hmm. more than that, who and how they're doing environmental ed with their students. And these teachers are green champions, so you know, tried and true. And it's it's really nice to see what what they find about teaching and some good some good insight into that. I think. Mm, thank you very much. I forget. We, we, we've been busy, yeah. so it's, it's hard to keep time. track of it all. Yeah. Um, we're just coming up to about the 40 minute mark and we thought we'd make this about a 40 minute uh, presentation. So we're just about on target. So I'm interested in whether you would like to share a few more of the ideas that you've been doing in your faculties of ed in the chat room. And we're happy to just make sure that everybody's um, reading those. Um, and, uh, and or uh, is there one idea from today's webinar that you might like to take forward to your own pre-service ed program and try out? Mm -hmm. uh, we'd be interested in hearing either of those. There's also a question from Doug. I saw it earlier. Oh, you sorry, Doug, did I miss a question? Oh, yep. Doug said 19 chapters uh, in the Springer publication that's coming out in the fall. Thanks, Doug. Doug was also the editor um, on that uh, publication as well. We have also got a special issue of the Canadian Journal of Environmental Education coming out on this topic, and it should be out, well, with any luck, before the end of 2019. That's mm -hmm. what we're aiming for anyway. Was this one? Does the CT TDSB collaboration carry over to practice experiences? Oh, uh, yeah. So that was an earlier question from Doug. Yes, Doug, we are um, uh, building a bigger sort of database, if you will, of eco schools teachers who are willing to take our teacher candidates for practicum. So what we're trying to do is very purposefully place. Um, our teacher candidates in those classrooms, our teacher candidates who are really keen so that they can see what happens in classrooms. I, I have a great story of this actually happening in this last fall, uh, sorry, in the last winter practicum. We took one of our really keen teacher candidates, we placed him with one of the keen teachers in our school board, and it was astounding to see what the two of those could accomplish, those two people accomplished together uh, moving forward um, over just, just over a month. When the teacher candidate came back, he did a presentation in a couple of different locations of what he was working on. And all of us were so impressed of the, not only exposure, but also the leadership skills he developed when he was there. Um, the teacher was working on a, 
uh, World Water Day that she did with the rest of the school. Um, he had access and experience with the Good Food Machine, a hydroponic growing tower they have in the classroom. He was doing eco poetry. Uh, he did some eco math. <laughs> it was just astounding what happens when you put champions together, teacher candidates and um, and practicing teachers. So we're looking forward to, we've got a, th a three year research study running alongside that um, particular collaboration with the TDSB and we're looking forward to sharing the results of that in hopes of inspiring other school boards and other faculties of ed to work together to do this work. Oh, carbon footprint exercise, powerful experience. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. And I don't know about you, uh, Paul, but when I've done those carbon footprint exercises with teacher candidates, uh, they're just, and with uh, practicing teachers, yes. by the way, we do yeah. summer PD courses down yeah. here, um, they're shocked. They, yeah. they had no clue that they're using up two to three to four to five times uh, the earth resources that they should be. <laughs> so uh, I think that's a, I agree, that's a great exercise to do. With and what I like about candidates. those two is that not only are you seeing like your footprint, but also like um, if you do the, the project neutrals one that they have online, you can put in extra information about things that you do um, implement in your life and you can see how like it positively affects your uh, footprint by shrinking your footprint. So things that you, I don't know, things that maybe you do every day that you think doesn't really matter, um, it, according to this project neutral calculator, it does. So some positive reinforcement as well as the shock and, and awe of how big the footprint is. It's good. Um, Alexander, and I'm not sure if you're saying you have appreciated our suggestions or you want more suggestions, but I'll put that question out to everybody in the webinar anyway about how to mobilize and include fellow faculty members because I agree that this is a really tough piece of the puzzle that we're trying to do. Um, you know, I, I, I would suggest that um, you, you hit them in the gut a little bit. So I've been showing to fa fellow faculty members um, Greta Thunberg's UN, it's a three and a half minute video of her, of her um, plea uh, to get adults, you know, on board. And I showed that just last week. I made reference to getting climate change on the departmental retreat. And uh, there's a number of my colleagues who had never seen that video before. I, I had just assumed that they would have yeah. seen it. And that was a silly assumption on my part. Um, and how powerfully affected they were by it. Um, and that was true for both staff and faculty members in our department. So I think, again, bringing that affective learning piece is a really important one um, to the forefront. Uh, we can give them all the facts and figures. And I think this is where Al Gore got a little tripped up. He had wonderful, it is inconvenient truth, wonderful charts, facts, figures, stats, research, but it doesn't touch people in the heart. And to really get people to want to do this work, we've got to bring together the, you know, the learning through the head, the heart, the yeah. hands. Yeah. When we engage the heart for both our fellow faculty members, as well as, um, uh, you know, engage the, the cognitive approach to, to learning, I think we're going to be far more effective in what mm -hmm. we're doing. I certainly have been um, uh, using teacher candidates, and this is one of the reasons that I wanted Elise to come in as one of our grads. I, whenever I can, I get our teacher candidates to go and do the advocacy work with the dean and the department chair, mm -hmm. because I don't know about your, in your faculty of ed, but I know that uh, they listen to our students, students most times uh, more carefully than they listen to faculty members. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is important to do, I think, as well. And so Becca says, I like the idea of working with in-service and pre-service yeah, teachers sure. together. Yeah, I think this is one that absolutely uh, for all of us. Uh, beneficial. And, yeah. and maybe um, if, if we can find a few other people who are doing it, maybe we could pull another webinar together about that one, Becca, sometime in the future. I think that might be really uh, worth, um, worth exploring. I know that at um, Simon Fraser University in uh, British Columbia on the west coast of Canada, they've been doing a little bit of experimentation with that as well. So um, if Richard's been doing some work on that too, maybe we can uh, pull something together because I think it's a really great model um, and, and I have to tell you the, the funding for it came from a really interesting source it's actually come from the school board and they've paid for it by putting solar panels on 300 school roofs and they got the board to agree to use the money the revenue from that um, from the energy that savings and things and the sale of carbon credits they've actually um, uh, gotten their board to dedicate any g revenue that's generated uh, specifically towards more sustainability uh, ventures and one of those is PD for their teachers so that's where the funding came from. I might want to back up a bit because not sure Becca's saying uh, school board might be something Oh different. a school board is like a school district in the states yeah. so it's a collection of schools in this case the 
Toronto District School Board is 575 schools that all come under the same, I know it's a huge board. They've got a budget of something like a billion dollars, like it's crazy. Uh, it's a huge, huge school district, um, but it allows schools to work together administratively. Um, and they have been, I think, again, uh, one of the leaders in terms of the Eco Schools program. It's like the Green Schools movement, the same thing here in Canada. Um, but the problem is they haven't been sharing it very broadly. So part of the collaboration that we're doing is to kind of toot their horn a little bit for mm -hmm. them and um, really um, share some of their wonderful practices that they've been doing, including uh, this new collaboration. Yeah. Uh, Heidi says to train pre-service teachers to use Project Learning Tree. And that's a great idea. And I know Project Learning Tree has had a really strong presence in the States in the past, Heidi. Not so much in Canada. They've actually just come to Canada. So we're looking forward to being able to uh, direct people uh, towards their resources because I know they've got a really great set of resources. We just need to uh, make sure it's tweaked to the Canadian curriculum standards. So a little different from the States. Yeah. Yep. And Judy says we have only one environmental elective that's offered every other year. Um, and so she's trying to figure out ways to infuse ESE into uh, other courses. And I agree, uh, I think that if we're really going to do this work well, Judy, that we um, absolutely have to do both. We need mm -hmm. to have those elective courses, because same thing, we've just got the one elective course here as well. But we also absolutely must find ways to infuse it into other courses. And, um, you know, in the past, we actually had a doctoral student, Erin um, Sperling, who's just wrapping up her doctoral work with us now, who used to act as a resource to go in to help teachers, because uh, her, her whole doctoral work is around ESE, and she used to go into teachers' class, uh, our, our faculty classrooms, to help uh, do that curriculum design piece. And so if you can get access to a graduate assistant who might be um, uh, a paid position for a doctoral candidate, that can be great experience for them, yeah. and also help provide that expertise for um, faculty members who might not be feeling as comfortable as they could be when it comes to doing ESE in their particular courses. Mm -hmm. Like I went into two courses today to talk about what we're doing at OISE into one of the classes. And that was great because we've played the Greta Thunberg video and talked about what we're doing. And a lot of people, some people were aware, but a lot of people weren't. And so for them, it was a great, great new avenue they could explore ways to get involved. Yep. Oh, Paul's got a great suggestion. He does a pre-year uh, retreat, which is actually, oh. I, if I remember properly, Paul, it's a program uh, that you run with your teacher candidates before the official program actually starts. It's a way to get them kind of minds on and get them understanding more uh, about what they're to anticipate for the year. So you've actually got an ESC rush session running as part of that. That's a fantastic idea, yeah. um, especially if you happen to have those warm-up sessions as part of a um, an outdoor experience. That's a great way to get them moving um, as part of that. Uh, Richard says, also an emphasis on education and not advocacy. Yes, I agree. So, so often we hear from our colleagues in faculties of ed that they don't want to do anything too political. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that depends a little bit on the, you know, uh, the community that you're in. I know that certainly in Alberta, which is one of our big energy producers in terms of provinces in Canada, that's um, bringing issues of ESE in is a, a little bit more of concern because for many of the teacher candidates and for the children they teach, their families work in the energy industry. And so that can be true of, you know, uh, communities that focus on coal mining, for example, or, uh, uh, you know, working in forestry. Uh, we have to be a little sensitive, right? I think um, in terms of each of these communities and, um, and how we, we move forward in terms of whether that's a political tact or whether that's an education tact or, or combination of both, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so Becca's pointed out that they're, they've also been finding some support from NSF, which is the Department of Public Instruction, mm -hmm. also from the Wisconsin Society for Science uh, Teachers. Yeah, I would agree that they've been supportive here too, um, Becca, that's a wonderful uh, suggestion. And also EE specific groups. We've been doing a lot of partnering with uh, NGOs in the Toronto area, just because there are so many of them. Uh, Food Share, uh, Learning for Sustainable Futures, uh, Evergreen, um, all sorts of wonderful organizations. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely agree with you that those partnerships are super important. They're more than happy to come in when they have access to classes of, of teacher candidates to share something about their expertise. Uh, food Share does wonderful workshops on food education, for example. And I think every community has these NGOs. They just got to go source them out and mm -hmm. see what kind of partnerships we can develop uh, with them. Yeah, I that's actually go. something that we've been talking about is you know, how can we better connect faculty with their local yeah. um, organizations and communities with their nature centers or yeah, NGOs or just looking at it statewide? Like what, what do we need to do here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we do that a lot with our Eco Fair, Fair conference. Sure. Year. So 
so it's great because it's like this free for all vendor thing and as a you know as a student coming in or even as a teacher coming in it's it's like a shopping spree because you have to go and talk to all these different people and see what resources they have for you online and you get tons of takeaway stuff um not always paper we try to dissuade that yeah. but uh always something like a link they can go to or a contact so it's great Oh, and Paul's clarified. He was actually talking about a pre-session for faculty, not for, uh, that's a great idea, Paul. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> I usually do a plug for our environmental and sustainability ed initiative, but I hadn't thought about doing a whole session and that would be a wonderful idea. Um, and uh, Alexander's um, just clarified that he says, if you are committed to ESE, you are thoroughly political and, and yeah. you are right. Yeah. Uh, it just depends on which foot you want to put forward first, I guess. <laughs> I know in some of the circles I play in, going in with my political foot forward sometimes doesn't play as well um, but if you uh, you know it, it there's different lenses that we can do this work through and uh, I just try to be sensitive to using a variety of different lenses that are appropriate for the context mm -hmm. that's all because um, I know that some some things work better than others yeah um, and Judy says that she'd love to learn more about Paul's session for faculty so Judy I think you know Paul so uh, I, I would encourage you to uh, to talk with him directly about that yeah, you know I was actually thinking like uh, we have just a few minutes yet before it's four o'clock um, and I, you know, we pointed you to the EE Pro Group so we can continue this conversation further. Um, but I'm, I'm curious too, you know, if there's, if there's interest in having additional webinars, um, kind of as a takeoff from this. So if you have ideas for future webinars too, I'd love to hear them if you want to put them down in the chat. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should invite Paul back to talk some more about his, the work that he does with faculty. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I kind of wanted to start wrapping things up a little bit and see if there were any other, you know, kind of final comments or questions. And again, if you have other thoughts on future webinars, please post them in the chat. Um, and I just want to again express our appreciation to NAAEE and EE Pro and, and Becca um, France and particularly for hosting today's webinar. We really appreciate the opportunity to bring the conversation to a wider group of people. Um, up on the screen, we've left uh, our contact information. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to us. And we do have a, a newsletter we run and a contact list. So you can go on our website and you can join uh, our group. Um, we welcome people from all over the world onto our contact list. Uh, it's not just for Canadians, <laughs> to be clear. Um, and we'll, we'll keep you in the conversation through regular newsletter updates. Uh, we have a blog that we run. Um, we'd love to continue the conversation through those means as well. Well, I just appreciate your time in joining us today. It was awesome to have met you years ago and to have mm -hmm. had a chance to come and visit you in Canada and see all of that massive group with the Environmental and Sustainability Ed and Teacher Ed program and um, to be a part of, I'm, I'm on their, news list, or their newsletter listing, so I encourage you all to do that. Um, so, Hillary and Elise, I really thank you for sharing your expertise today. Uh, and everyone else, I, I've enjoyed reading all of your thoughts and ideas. This has been a really interactive webinar. So thank you for posing the questions and thank you for um, sharing everything that you, that you did today. Appreciate thank it you. greatly. Great. It has everyone. been great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for your contributions. Definitely. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.